I can't hear that at all. No, neither can I. Dan, you're muted. Okay, how about now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> I, can hear, I can hear you now. Good, good, good. Okay, welcome everyone to Contra Maneuvers. Um, this week we've got a, kind of a number of things uh, going on. Um, so we're, we've got two, two talks, um, one by David Blandy and the other one by um, a company called um, Zanman Bureau. Um, but first of all, we've got, a, like a, I guess, an opportunity for you guys. Um, and we've got um, these guys from XP Awards and to talk about their uh, awards. And um, they're essentially, well, they can kind of explain a little bit more about themselves and, and their kind of angle, but they're interested in um, competitive gameplay. And, um, and so we thought this was a really good opportunity for students that generally, we have a lot of students that are into gaming just more widely. So um, yeah, so this could be a good thing to kind of get involved with. So maybe I can give the stage to these guys for a second. Hi guys, so my name is Bram, I'm from uh, Stakester and I am the games curator. Um, I think I have the best job in the world because I play games all day. I'm being serious. Um, so we have uh, an app called Stakester where we connect gamers to play competitively for money. Uh, we've got games like UFC, FIFA and NBA. And then we've got another part of the app where you can play mobile games. So that's stuff like Fruit Ninja, we're trying to like those kind of games. You play competitively, you get better. Um, and at the moment we're trying to connect ourselves with new um, artists in the industry and give them an opportunity to get into the industry, make the game that you love and uh, start a career. I'll pass it to yeah, so basically I started at Statesdor about six months ago. Um, I'm the designer there, so I graduated from fine art last year um, and I sort of wanted to create an opportunity for other art and design students that want to get into the same sort of industry that I'm in within games. And I know that a lot of students like games, especially when you're studying art. Um, I was the same, so I thought it would be a really great opportunity for people to not only win money, um, which is obviously great as a student, <laughs> but also get a foot into the door within the industry. So um, all you have to do is submit a piece of artwork based on your favourite video game and we have, you can win a cash prize of up to £1,000. Um, so there's four awards, you have the main prize is £1,000 and the others are all 500 um, We're going to choose 30 people to go and exhibit in central London um, and it also gives you an opportunity to get internships with the games companies um, with other design companies and with stakes for ourselves as well. Um, so it was a really great opportunity for everyone um, so we're really excited to see everyone submit and yeah, you can go to xpawards.gg and submit, or you can follow us on Instagram to keep updated with everything. We have a few announcements coming out um, very soon. So, yeah, follow us on Instagram and check it out. Just because Hannah forgot, um, the big names that we're going to have who are going to be judging your artwork is um, Epic Tour. Epic Games are coming, um, so they'll be one of the people you can get your art in front of to say, hey, this is the work that I produce. Give me an internship maybe if you were to win the award um, also the last award that we do is a public vote um, of 30 other pieces of artwork so you can get your friends to vote for you nab you know your mom your cousins and Anne. try and get all those votes for you for the 500 pound award and an internship if you have any questions we'll be just outside of the lecture hall so come talk to us we're here for the next couple of hours aren't we yeah we're going to stay until about two so, so about two o'clock so come and ask us some questions if you have any or you can drop me a DM on Instagram and I'll answer anything you have. We haven't got Okay, so um, yeah, as I said, um, so the first person we've got up today um, is called um, David Blandy. So David, are you, hopefully you're with us? Yeah, here I am. Brilliant, okay. So um, yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're yeah, all connected and we can hear you, so maybe you'd like to I introduce yourself and um, yeah, we'll, we'll get started. Hi, um, yeah, thank you for having me and um, thanks for this, this space. Um, I'm an artist who's been working with things around pop culture, but specifically gaming um, and the internet for, I guess, the last 20 years. <laughs> so I guess I'm quite old. But um, 
primarily I, I've used these things to try and work out um, who I am, who I could be, um, but also who we are and who we could be. How things like um, the space of gaming, the, um, the communities that form around these spaces, like um, say the fighting game community or the community that that's built around things like tabletop role play games, how these things can show us ways to um, create society in different ways. Um, I thought the first thing that I'd show you today um, is a film that I made where I was trying to come to terms with my love of Japanese culture. Um, it's kind of complicated for me because uh, my grandfather was a Japanese prisoner of war. He was kept in um, a prison of war camp for three years during the Second World War. And after that, he never ate rice again and uh, refused to buy Japanese cars, that sort of thing. And of course, I grew up loving Japanese culture. Um, anime, manga, um, had a really close friend um, who we, we played baseball together and stuff. And it, yeah, it, it became this sort of very um, complicated knot that I wanted to, to try and untie and un understand. And so um, I thought about the story of William Adams, who's the first Englishman in Japan, um, landed in 1599 um, and became a, uh, a samurai and um, founded the Japanese Navy, quite bizarrely, and in the end never left again, um, and used that as uh, essentially a, a metaphor for, for my own thoughts around uh, myself, Japan, gaming, um, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, um, that, I'll show you that one first. That's, um, I can't click on it myself. <laughs> that is uh, the third film, this is Backgrounds. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not the middle one. It's the one that starts with black there. The next one. Hi guys. <laughs> Thanks. I thought retelling the story of William Adams, the only English samurai, would be a way to think about my relationship with Japan and England's colonial past. Because this was one of European colonialism's real failures. They went to trade, to exploit an untapped market, but ended up precipitating the total closure of Japan from the outside world. And William Adams, rather than returning to England a rich man, ended up being the well-paid servant of the Shogun. And that made me think of Ulysses 31, the Japanese reimagining of Homer's Odyssey in space. My introduction to Greek myth was through this veil of cultural appropriation. For me, William Adams became Odysseus, undertaking an endless journey, exiled from home. But maybe England wasn't Ithaca, it was Japan. Seeing Japanese prints for the first time, 300 years after the Renaissance, must have been like seeing the other side of the moon. The flatness, the cut-off composition, license with perspective, these messages from another planet, used as packaging for porcelain, helped to destroy what everyone knew as art, to fuel the move to a modern aesthetic modern art. When I was small, I became friends with a boy from Chiba. His mother tried to cook food I would enjoy and served cold, tinned mushroom soup. I always knew there was something awkward for my family about my friendship with Toru. It took a long time to realise the trauma my grandfather had gone through, all those years as a prisoner of war. Not to ever eat rice again, to use his rice bowl as an ashtray. 
Of course, in the end, it was the smoking that killed him. I grew up on English games, but already Japan was there. Ryu, the eternal warrior, chivalrous, barefooted, Japanese. But it was probably the Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy VII, that cemented my fascination. The first computer game to make me cry. Bedridden by the flu, playing for days, and then Ares dies. A character you've cared for, nurtured in the virtual world, removed from the game, with no second chance. I wonder if William Adams would have lived his life the same way if he had known that he would never have got back to England, back to his family. To have travelled for almost two years, watching most of his shipmates die through storms, violence and starvation, it must have been like being reborn, a second life. Japanese has multiple ways of saying I, to the extent that there's no direct equivalent to the I that I grew up with, the I of I think therefore I am. The I that you use is defined by who you are with, not static like in English. The group defines the self. People sometimes say I look a bit Japanese. Maybe it's my eyes, or my glasses. But why didn't William Adams try harder to leave? Like Bowie in The Man Who Fell to Earth, he gave all his technology. They built the ships, but still he didn't go. Maybe he was scared of the journey, which is pretty reasonable. But maybe he just preferred life in Japan. I knew something of Japan before I came, from computer games, cartoons and pictures, stories of apocalypse, childish fun and monsters. I expected spacesuits and shiny surfaces, sublime beauty. But the streets are dusty, sweets tasteless. Japan is a myth, the way every nation is a myth. Japan's myth is pure contradiction. A place of peace and tranquility, zen-like beauty. With organised crime, brutal armies and ritualistic self-sacrifice. Blade Runner with Cherry Blossom. Neon signs of huge-eyed children, 6,000-year-old trees. In the year 1600, William Adams fell into this place, a visitor from another world. Europe was starting to lay claim to the world, but Japan's alternate reality sidestepped it all, closing itself off from the outside. But 35 years before seclusion, William Adams landed after nearly two years of sailing and horror. Of the five ships and over 500 men that left Europe, only 10 men arrived. Surviving starvation, mutiny, storms, and the treacherous Straits of Magellan, the 17th century Englishman found a new home, the only European samurai, advisor to the shogun, an Englishman in Japan, forever a gaijin, an outsider. I went looking for an image of Japan, the image of photographs, the image of the popular imagination, exists, but only inside the frame of the picture. Outside is the ugly municipal architecture, homeless men taking their shoes off to enter their cardboard boxes, strangers laughing in your face because you're so tall, so strange. Japan is a cipher, a receptacle for Western fantasy. Events like MCM Expo in England are essentially celebrations of Japanese pop culture. Thousands of people dressing as their favourite game character or anime hero. An imitation of a Japanese phenomenon of imitation, cosplay. Some of the most perfect punks I've ever seen were in Tokyo. Every detail considered immaculate, a pure copy of the image of late 70s English youth. 
pure surface. Japan has always lived with the constant threat of annihilation. From earthquake, volcano, tsunami, or nuclear disaster. Godzilla, Akira, Hiroshima. Death is imminent, so enjoy the cherry blossom. Andromeda once told me, life and death are the same. Forget Albion. A million things can happen before we make our way home. You must leave karma to karma. Today you are here, and nothing you can do will change that. Tomorrow does not exist. There is only now. There is only this moment. Nothing else. Nothing. The credits roll, scrolling over the world. Forests, grasses, rivers. The world looks so beautiful now. The Chocobos can be seen running, and the Hiryu swoops over them. A lot of my practice has been around sampling, uh, taking things from different places uh, and putting them in new contexts, I suppose, like uh, collage or um, like a hip hop DJ. It's, I, I guess it started from me being a hip hop DJ, <laughs> um, looking for beats on, um, on old dusty records um, and yeah, being in a band for years and years. Um, and then taking that into my art practice, uh, thinking about um, how often we're just a whole combination of parts um, from across your cultural experience. So, um, you know, how do you separate the you that is at home talking to your parents from the you that is with your friends down the arcade? Um, yeah, the, these sorts of different versions of yourself that exist that are each in turn influenced by all these these different factors um and yeah part of that was investigating my relationship to to hip-hop and my love of soul music and i ended up doing a, a bunch of um, works thinking about um yeah what it meant for me to be walking down the street um rapping along to the Wu-Tang Clan in my head. Um, and it, they turned into these lip sync works. Um, one of them, I traveled down into the underground, um, miming, well, not miming, but say, saying out loud, but what you hear is, the, is um, Bring the Ruckus by, by the Wu-Tang Clan. And this, this work in particular started making me think about um, my position, uh, my ethnicity, um, I guess the post-colonial condition, uh, thinking about Britain and its its place, and empire, and our relationship to race, and all of those things um, opened up a kind of a, a stream of thought in me that led eventually to um, collaborating with um, another artist called Larry Achenpong. Um Just gonna take that away. Uh, we've now been working together for the last um, last 10 years. Uh, we started off as a hip hop crew. We would be stealing beats and rhymes from different places. We called ourselves the biters um, and performing in galleries, in rooms like the one you're in, sat in now, um, in um, kind of more like small clubs and things, but always like, yeah, reciting recycled rhymes um, over basically recycled beats. Um, yeah, seeing ourselves as sort of like, um, almost like human sampling machines in a way. Um, and there came a point where we stopped wanting to be, I guess, the entertainment for the evening uh, at, a, 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 at a gallery opening or something and wanted to start making, um, making work that really talked about our um our position our our friendship 
our relationship to each other in a way, but also our relationship to history and geopolitics. Um, and of course, um, ideas around race and identity. Larry Achampong is a guy named British. Um, I'm white British, um, grew up in London. Um, two white parents in kind of, yeah, Queen's Park, Kilburn type area. Um, and we had a lot that brought us together that we had in common, our loves of, of video games, hip hop, um, we kind of, yeah, I guess we, we kind of first bonded, like talking about bits of, um, Zelda Ocarina of Time and Metal Gear Solid and these sorts of now ancient video games, but, um, these, yeah, but so when we came to making the films, um, we thought of how can we take this conversation into a new arena, a new place. And first of all, we thought about creating alter egos for ourselves, um, having ourselves in tweed suits mm -hmm. like uh, Franz Fanon and uh, jean paul Sartre, having their conversation in the 1950s, um, talking about, um, yeah, at that time, the colonial condition and what that means for the self. Uh, how do you form yourself when you're constantly um, denigrated and graded? Um, and we also heard about these plays, these plays that Franz Fanon had written, uh, which had since been lost. Um, they've now been found again, they've been published. Um, but at the time that we made this film, they were lost. And so it became a kind of a metaphorical journey to try and find these bits of uh, fiction that would um, maybe get, shine some light on what the way forward is. Because um, Fanon's incredible work, like uh, Black Skin, White Masks or The Wretched of the Earth, really pinpoint a lot of the issues of the colonial condition, but in some ways they don't offer a, I guess, a solution. And so, um, yeah, can there be a solution? Um, we've, I've kind of come to the conclusion now that, that really all we can do is just keep talking and keep conversations open. Like uh, Stuart Hall would say that there should be this unfinished conversation. But um, yeah, this work that I'm going to show you was our first entry into the virtual arena, making a, a, bit, a, um, a film inside of uh, Grand Theft Auto V using the um, camera in-game editor. So it's, yeah, it's a work of machinima, as they call it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's um, this film here, which is the, the one the, the one with the black screen as the first screen. If we can show that. Uh, uh, we not, uh, no, the next one. I've been thinking about making a film and the next about one. flying. So I'm going to use a G. Thanks. They came upon the intersection. Fanon lived in a comfortable house in a comfortable part of the island. His life mapped out for him by his comfortable parents. But he knew he didn't belong. He saw through the virtual edifice left behind by the settler. And so he left, seeking a new place a new place of the like-minded, the forward-thinking, the righteous. And he fought. He fought for his new friends, for the right to life. But no matter how hard he pressed against the old machine, he knew he didn't belong. So he proposed a new world, an equal plane, to oppose the hate he found. And he's still waiting. 
perhaps he's waiting here, inside the polygons, behind the texture maps, through the fields of algorithms, somewhere in the intersection. And so they continued their unfinished conversation. He asked the other, where are we going? The great success story of humanity has been the consolidation of power, of wealth. This tale of progress has overshadowed revolution, uprising and protest, accelerated by war imposed through pillaging and oppression. The human resource, mind of all use value, discarded, shut down. What is the future? SMS organized riots, flesh born fuel cells. What are they going to do with all the bodies? Asantiwa? Nasir, Nkrumah, Zinga, Siko Tore, Makiba, Lumumba. They were markers of a new world. There was so much hope then. These sunsets are the most beautiful they'd ever seen. There are so many unmarked boundaries, areas of exclusion, edges of the traversable world. How can they tell what is forbidden? They have called us many things over the ages, swarms, immigrants, malformed, and worse. And they still want to wear our masks, mimic our movements. What if Fanon's message was not simply one of love, but a warning of the impending reality that we are asleep to? Wake up, my friend. Let us search for the answer. This hashtag, I could not shake. There we are, so very near to the end of the cliff. The lion in the road, the invisible wall in the video game. Like the terrorised animal, forced to the corner, we must fight back. Why? It is simple. We can no longer breathe. Of course none of this exists, but it is a real experience. Their skin changes their experience of the world, their interactions, their dreams, constructed realities that have shaped them. The virtual edifices of history, wealth, nationality, property. All fantasies that chain them to their place, mind forged manacles. We love our master, these guided key swipes and button presses, first person, high definition submission to relentless dictatorship, spending our lives embedded in the master's plans. Do you really think Fanon is here? Is there some remnant of his plays embedded on the top of that mountain, above that rendered sky? He responded, From the moment I became a father, I was awoken from another layer of stasis. I knew that there would come a day that my son would be charged for his mere existence. Today I am baptised. 
awoken once more from another layer for the birth of my daughter opens my eyes to all the concentrated madness that wishes to crush her. Do you understand? This is not the old day. The cheek has been bruised beyond repair. A new dawn beckons. If I am guilty, then let it be that I am guilty of dreaming of emancipation. Someone once said, only when restraint is exercised at the right moment in the calm of night, then can power be exemplified. But when will we find peace? When will we find our way through the intersection? Only the oppressor knows peace. Because he is rarely challenged. So yeah, after um, working so much with these um, video game graphics, etc., um, making my own uh, Street Fighter type game where um, I played off the different alter egos that I had um, from my various performance works, and um, yeah, had them fight against each other. So you could sit down at this cabinet. Um, also um, work with my dad, who's a um, landscape artist, asked him to draw all the backgrounds from um, video games that I used to play, like um, Garou, Mark of the Wolves, uh, Fatal Fury, um, King of Fighters, um, Street Fighter 3, and um, turn them into pastel drawings, and then um, made this video inside of the, the backgrounds that were, were his inspiration where we talked about the process so um yeah after all of this 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 sort of virtual gaming um i was quite yeah i started falling in love with the idea of um the tabletop role play game um, the archetype is i guess dungeons and dragons um where and yeah the power of the voice within that that space um that this is a, these are games that are made from primarily um, just a conversation at a table. Um, so you have um, people who is, each of you assumes a character, one person acts as the um, judge or game master or dungeon master, um, acting as the world. And um, together you form a, a kind of weird virtual space between you where you're all imagining the same space in kind of different levels of, of clarity. It's sort of, uh, yeah, I often joke about it being um, like the best graphics card that you could ever get because it's just your imagination. And um, I had this project that I was doing at a place called Canby Wick in, um, on Canby Island in Essex. Um, and it's a space that um, was due to be part of an oil reserve in the uh, in the 1970s. And then there was a massive oil crash um, because of various geopolitical events. And um, the site was abandoned and it was left to nature for until now. Um, and is now a site of special scientific interest. And um, yeah, it's one of the most biodiverse spaces in the UK. And I saw this story of rebirth, of um, life coming back as um yeah a, a kind of powerful allegory for what what needs to happen for um the earth to survive so um and at the same time i've been reading a lot of um 
sci-fi, uh, different sorts of, of fiction, uh, like, um, yeah, the uh, Word for World, World is Forest by um, Ursula Le Guin, or, um, yeah, and the Dis Dispossessed, and um, a Philip Gay Dick story, um, which details kind of life, um, everyone living in vast areas underground and kind of melded it all together into this this fiction um the world after which is um yeah it's a role play game book it was made in collaboration with um a whole load of uh, gamers in um in south end which is near near uh canby wick and um so it was a effectively a, a game about collaborating to create a new future made through collaboration um and is kind of played out through collaboration so that that was sort of sort of the, the basic premise of, of the whole whole project um also yeah documented the space filming it over a year kind of filming these creatures in with in macro um turning tiny creatures into uh, effectively giant monsters on these uh on these huge projections um and it became a whole world to inhabit um a world where um humanity had escaped into um, underground havens um for eight thousand years and had mutated and evolved while they were down there due to various magic forces and uh were now um, re-emerging to this this new verdant world the surface world um and yeah discovering what is there so it kind of becomes a a, a tale of sort of re-emergence and as soon as i finished this project um towards the end of um the gallery show um covid started happening and it yeah it kind of you know changed the world um changed our relationship to everything and everything started moving online and and suddenly this this work gained a whole new sort of meaning really the the idea of seclusion the idea of uh, being locked away and i got deeper into the gaming community like the tabletop role-playing gaming community um and realized that what i'd done was make something that was kind of akin to the the dungeons and dragons books that i'd grown up with and sort of ignored the uh, present movements of, of of gaming the kind of yeah this this whole massive explosion of um independent producers that are, are making all sorts of extraordinary zines all over the world um and so i started working on this this follow-up the lost eons which is instead like zine based um it's really stripped down the rules very simple and um yeah you can start playing in kind of almost no time but what it does is it creates yeah a, a kind of a, a space for the imagination that everyone can kind of fall into and um yeah that's that's kind of um a whole whole world that that has been kind of emerging for me but um at the same time i've been thinking more about about gaming and about computer games and um i don't know something about um the kind of the whole cyberpunk aesthetic kind of intrigued me and um so i'll just show you one last film which is the um yeah it's i don't know if you'll be able to tell but i don't actually speak at all during this this um film it's actually um all an algorithm but yeah Check it out. I've been here before. The neon lights. The grime on the computer keyboards. Steam flooding the alleys from dingy storefronts. Not in life, but in another dream thousand other dreams. Was it a film? Or a memory? 
or just a premonition. It feels real, but the same elements keep repeating. The stained window there is duplicated three windows along. Even the steam appears in similar clouds. A vision of a life, procedurally generated. And this stupid outfit, like an armored ninja playing paintball. There is something cool about it though. Here's where dead stories come back to life, zombie visions of the future. This shadow plane is a world of pure visibility. It looks like this place should smell rank. But there's no smell. I look like I'm breathing, my chest heaving. But I don't need to breathe. I'm not speaking, but my voice is here, a deep fake, as a remnant, a trace of how I once sounded, voicing an avatar in an unreal engine. Cyberpunk is seen as the only realistic future, because it's impossible to imagine the end of capitalism. It's a logical end state, everyone enthralled to corporations, huge surveillance states, Adding utility to our bodies through cybernetics if we can afford it. Lives of grim scavenging if we can't. The end point of the metaverse. Plugged into the network so you can pay to unlock your front door. Charge your exoskeleton. A web, a cage. It's like the fungi that takes over ants' brains. Forcing them to climb up tall plants. After eating the ant from the inside, the fungus releases spores to spread across the forest. Ghosts in phantom pain. Orientalism is at the core of cyberpunk aesthetics, both fetishized and othered. Advanced medicine and ubiquitous cyberware becomes an excuse to erase disabled visibility, homogenized normalcy. Images of cyberpunk often merge with the transhuman, the idea you can build better humans through implants and prosthetics. But transhumanism, with its visions of colonizing Mars and infinite life, often becomes heroic futuristic fascism, ignoring narratives of otherness, of difference, centering the white hetero man at the expense of all, a ravenous monster that never stops, never dies. I'm fighting a lineage of mistakes. Stories only exist in stories. Here I am, lost in the memory of a game I've never played, a life I never lived. I've heard of replications so perfect, even the subject themselves believes itself to be real. I don't care if I'm an original or a copy or what. You and I are going to die right here. If we both die, there won't be a copy anymore now, will there? But even if these memories in my head are fiction, what we've had is something special. That's what alchemy is. It's the power to change the world through your thoughts. Your greatest power to change the world is your power to change your mind about the world. And all minds are joined. There's really no place at which you stop and I start. The real you is not a body at all, but rather a spirit, an energy, an idea. The real you is a being of light, and therefore has no material density. Fear weighs you down, but love lightens you. We must become what we cannot perceive. Is you papika steen emel emaz 82b? Lair. Sleeve ti. Noitinoma but su jar o. Irima mi ar o. Em lif a tie sa w. Smed rito di nasu at a. Med rito na nai 2b. Ethel nai to n. Esti norfrot signid morf siela a nidulf mi des. Estreabiek ritup mok a no emog a t. Sdh gil non a t. Hirofa virain ni bevi. So that's um, a short whistle stop tour through my practice, through the things that I do. Um, often 
in collaboration with lots of other people, obviously. Um, I was wondering if there were any questions from the floor. Otherwise, I could just talk some more. I can't see anyone, but you know. <laughs> any questions? Anyone? No? I think there might be questions in a moment. Um, oh, here's one. Ready. So you won't be able to hear without you sound off. Oh, okay. Hi there. Hello. Um, you you cut off a little bit during that, um, and you were talking about D and D, and then there was this like a we, we were part way through a cyberpunk video. So I just kind of wanted to know about the through line there because we we lost a little bit of the context. <laughs> Okay. I'm so, sorry if that if that's a bit of a bother. I'm just I just I like D and D and I'm curious. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess D and D is sort of a core part of where where I am right now in terms of um, yeah my practice, thinking about how to work with others and how to um, create more, new models for community, but still. Um, my thinking around um, how we use virtual spaces and our space within them um, is still around. And, uh, it's just a work that I made um, very, it's like the most recent work that I made, so I thought I'd show it. <laughs> That's basically the true, true thought, uh, if that makes sense. Yes, okay, good, great. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry if that seemed rather random. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got another question over here. Okay, good. Hi, um, it's quite funny um, that you're here today because I was actually at one of your lectures in South End a few years ago when oh, you wow. just released your game. Um, so I just wanted to know how it's doing, like, and and you know, is it commercialized now? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know it, it exists it's a lovely it's a lovely book and um it kind of yeah went out it's 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 sold a, probably a couple of hundred copies or something like it's 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 a thing but um its follow up is doing kind of well which is it's much like like i was trying to talk about it's um it's more zine based so they're little a5 pamphlets and um it's much, much, much looser and lighter rules. And um, yeah, it's, but the, the basic setting is quite similar. Um, it's sort of, yeah, pared down and, and um, yeah, you should check it out. It's called Lost Eons. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming to the talk all, all that time ago, back in real life. Okay, guys, any other questions? We're learning one. <laughs> okay, they're very quiet. So I'm um, uh, pulling. Got no. Okay, well, um, uh, yeah, it's um, been a fascinating talk, and and uh, certainly I, th I think I'm probably a similar age to you, and uh, all your reference points are uh, chiming. I think the Ulysses 31 or 3031 or whatever is is. Um, if no one's seen it, I really recommend it. It's um, it's uh, it's a, it's a really great. It was it was it French or was it Japanese? It was a French Japanese co-production. Right, right, yeah. So um, it's a really beautifully animated version of uh, Homer's Odyssey. And to be honest, it wasn't until much later that I learned about Homer and realised, hang on, that's that was what that cartoon was about. And I'd sort of been stealth taught sort of uh, Homer's Odyssey through cartoons, which I think is always a, you know, an amazing um, thing when it, when it happens, you sort of, you realize you, you sort of it got in through the back door, but, um, but yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. And just the, the names and all the stuff that, um, yeah, became sort of second nature, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, so uh, re really interesting to, to, to hear what you're doing and um, yeah, thanks for coming. So maybe we can give a round of applause. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so next we've got um, the next talker. So we might need a few seconds to, to just readjust the screen and connect the right person. But thanks, David. That was really brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers.
So have we got Craig on the Brilliant. Okay. So um so uh yeah, everyone, hi, we're um, we're pretty much ready to go now. So we've managed to connect up um the next speaker, um Morand. Um I think that's how you pronounce your name. Hi Morand, how you doing? Hey, how are you? How you doing? Not so bad. So um yeah, as I say, it was part of a double bill, this one. Um and um uh, Morand is joining us. He's representing uh, his, uh, I think it's his company, um, um, Zanman Bureau, and is going to talk more about um, what he gets up to. But um, maybe you can introduce yourself and uh, yeah, we'll start from there. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, the invitation uh, by Pauline and all the, the team in the university. So my name is Morad Montadzami. I'm a French Iranian which means that my parents uh, migrated from Iran to France in the beginning of the 70s and because I was born in the beginning of the 1980s. Um, and I will speak, uh, let's say, with three different caps, which are complementary anyway. So uh, publisher, uh, curator, which is to to make exhibitions, and art historian, which is not so important. So let's just stick to uh, publisher and curator. Um, the idea is to share with you my experience about the field of um, curatorial studies, or you know, just shaping a curatorial activity around the uh, global south you could say um, which i generally describe as uh, arab african and asian modernities it's the the broadest way but also the the more uh, the most neutral uh, categorization of the territories or the histories that we with my platform we try to to explore and to cover and to 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 valorize um, in books and exhibitions uh, so the idea is also that we are an independent platform. So I would I would not describe us as a strictly a publisher or a curator, but let's say a publishing and curatorial platform. Um, and at the same time, we're doing the same thing pretty much as a museum but not exactly because for example, we don't, uh, conserve and we don't uh, preserve any artwork but we conceive exhibitions uh, and we publish books so which means that we invented i would say or created a certain model or framework in which as an independent structure or platform we produce books and exhibitions around Arab, African, and Asian modernities and art histories, but connected to institutions. Most of our projects would be projects implemented with us or by us, but with, a muse with an existing museum, with an institution uh, in, in different countries. And maybe I should also, before I go on to our website which is the best place to to check our general activity and books and exhibitions and go into details maybe it's interesting also that i explain to you that uh, i was previously a curator at the tate modern in london a curator for middle east and north african arts which is the geographical label the Tate uses, right? Because all geographical and cultural categorization entails certain interrogation and certain theoretical or political problem, you know, in, in function of how you name places in, in reference to, to a certain population. 
Um, but it's still important, of course, because if I wasn't a curator at the Tate Modern, and even if I was a part-time curator, even, even if I was a research curator, which is even more specific and therefore not entirely embedded maybe in the everyday institution life, but more as a as a uh, an associate researcher, but who basically worked with the Tate uh, Modern Museum and, and staff for almost five years uh, in London, uh, even if I'm based in Paris and my parents come from Iran, so now you have the whole picture. But if I didn't do that, if I didn't get this opportunity to occupy this position at the Tate Modern, between 2014 and 2019 i wouldn't i probably wouldn't be here so which means i wouldn't have been able to create what i created as an independent platform because i don't work for the tate modern anymore and my project is to collaborate with different institutions in different countries in different contexts um even if the middle eastern and north african or more general uh, arab and african countries uh, political situation leaves little opportunities for making projects in those countries or to make you know proper exhibitions whether in egypt or lebanon or iraq or morocco but but we still tend to do i mean we still tend to collaborate with these countries as well but uh okay let's just uh, sum it up by saying that uh, maybe of course if i didn't occupy this position at the tate for five years it's not that i really couldn't um create an independent platform but it would have taken much more time because obviously the thing the the things that i learned and the people that i connected with during the five years with the tate was uh, like a super uh, accelerator of course so this is to be taken into account anyway but uh, it doesn't mean that it's not possible to make it even from scratch but of course, it's also to say maybe that there is an important part of what you call networking, which is inherent, I'm afraid, in a way, to this um, to this kind of job. I mean, in this in this specific field, at least of uh, working with museums, of course. Um, okay, so maybe now we can go into different projects. So maybe we shall look at exhibitions first um just so you can get the scale also uh, a more accurate idea of uh, the scale of projects we have been working on or we we have elaborated uh, this is our website uh, so maybe i i should have repeated so the name of the platform is uh, zamon books and curating very simply zamon books and curating and the the website is uh, zamon zaman bc.com but anyway i can send the link uh, to the organizers of course uh, here was an exhibition done in tehran in iran which is a very specific uh, context actually uh, an exhibition of uh, three Iranian woman artist, uh, Fadi Shams, Mitra Farahani, Sima Khatami, who all the three of them live outside of Iran in different European countries. And it was the first time they exhibited in their homeland, let's say. Um, so it was three different artists, but brought together uh in a gallery space with different type of interactive installation around the subject of art history or images art historical images artworks reproduction as a, a way of collecting images and 
collecting the memory of uh, these images of art history, uh, which was in inspired by a German art historian of the, the beginning of the 20th century, whose name was A.B. Warburg. That's why the title of this show was Mnemosyne Syndrome, because the Mnemosyne was the name of the, the visual archive that this um, peculiar gentleman, Ebi Warburg, had collected uh, in, in a German library, uh, iconographic library, often considered as the ancestor of the internet in terms of collecting images in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, this project didn't really give way to a book, unfortunately, but it was still a great opportunity to show women Iranian artists living outside of Iran in Iran. And the one of the first, maybe uh, middle scale institutions so, you know, not yet the big museum that um, gave, um, gave me their uh, confidence to, to develop a whole project in a longer term perspective was the Mosaic Rooms in London. Uh, obviously, again, because I had worked for the Tate Modern, so I had developed some grounds and, and network in, in town. So the Mosaic Rooms was is one of the rare uh, uh, Arab culture and contemporary art center in in a in a big European capital. I mean, there are some others, but Mosaic Rooms is considered a very uh, interesting uh, place. And we had proposed to exhibit a series of three exhibition. Uh, the one that you see here is the exhibition around Hamed Abdallah, who was an Egyptian painter uh, and also a, a thinker, a, a kind of visual philosopher who accumulated loads of archives and visual knowledge around the Mediterranean and a very diverse and fragmented notion of Arab identity through his paintings as well. Um, uh, so as you can see, it was an exhibition where the the, the geographical uh, wanderings and the uh, individual journey of the artist between Egypt and Europe and and also Palestinian uh, solidarity movements. Uh, he he also exhibited in in Lebanon. I mean, we're talking mainly about figures from the 20th century. So uh, we're talking about Hamed Abdallah as one of the pioneer of modernism in, in Egypt. But it was interesting to include those geographical arrows or those fragmented maps into the display itself, and also to in integrate digital archives or to, to digitize a certain amount of uh, archival material that you don't want to limit to only a vitrine but you want to show on slideshows, screens, and make it a more interactive relationship to, to the archives, because obviously we're working on a historical project, so there's a need for uh, collecting the archives and exhibiting it. Uh, the website is, of course, also in, in English. Um, you just need to click on English. And so the project with Mosaic Rooms developed through uh, another, let's say, modern uh, pioneer in, who was an Iranian woman, again, uh, Behjat Sadr, for an exhibition entitled The Dusted Waters. She was a painter who was dealing a lot with the black color and blackness as, as an aesthetic uh, of her post calligraphic painting, which were also very optical and, and had a lot of visual effects to it. So it was also a nice experience to, to display them uh, and to find a kind of mise en scène, of course, um, 
which can you know make the the work uh, always more attractive but also more embedded in its historical context always including archives photographs uh for example here this wall of the exhibition is literally designed like a notebook page with someone who would have collected photos of her own and writing a, a, a short poem and or her ID ID card uh, photocopy or next to uh, something written by hand onto the wall as if the artist had written it herself. I mean, taken from her quotes next to a next to a, a real painting exhibited. Um, so this is also part, of course, of uh, elaborating uh, an exhibition, um, including a certain mise en scène and a, a certain organization of space. Um, and so, obviously, when you when you want to to do the best you can, or or to use all the resource you you think you can collect and you can distribute within different projects uh, you sh you sh you try to anticipate by proposing more or pr that's why we propose to do a whole series of exhibition and the, the third one we we curated again for the mosaic rooms was about the moroccan uh, avant-garde movement of the casablanca art school uh, with mohammed melehi as the one of the main protagonists of that uh, Moroccan art school, uh, the Casablanca group with other artists like Farid Belkahia and Mohamed Sheba. But here you can see that it deals a lot also with uh, published material like posters, vintage books, journals, magazines, exhibition posters or um, manifesto, uh, aesthetics and design. Um, and to, to try to retrace that kind of uh, artistic production and uh, the, the first avant-garde movements, let's say, um, at the time of uh, different countries' independence, for example, after Morocco's independence. Uh, so again, trying to show the works in, a, in an alternative way than a strict museum space, so using some... Uh, some free standing panels or zigzagging walls to try to match with the aesthetics of the of their work of their works of their paintings so this was a very important project because the casablanca art school really uh, feels very compelling to to a lot of institution and a lot of uh, curators so we had the chance to be invited or to you know to find the opportunity to travel the the exhibition uh, so the after the london uh, venue which was a whole uh, infrastructural experience in itself of course to to have a whole you know, group of artworks and archive that are each of them is in, invented and uh, with an insurance and, you know, created, uh, you know, all the infrastructure obviously around uh, uh, such a group of, uh, of artworks and archive coming from different lenders. So, you know, with, uh, so this is the Marrakesh venue of the same exhibition entitled new waves uh, about casablanca art school so the whole exhibition would be readapted obviously to uh, different sets of rooms and a different scenography um and again yeah the whole infrastructure uh behind the loans and all these objects in order to make them travel and not go back to their country of origin where the owners is but to another venue and even to a third venue uh, as we we were able to expand to to dubai in the emirates which is also a very specific context here as you can see in dubai we we were we were of course uh, uh, in a much easier financial context because uh, because of their economy which is a 
let's say a flourishing economy and um, and we could even uh, conceive a wall paintings as you can see here directly inspired from uh, Mohammed Melehi's uh, murals and fresco painting that he he did in in a lot of Moroccan streets um, and the exhibition itself again readapted reshuffled visually and and from a, a, sp a spatial perspective um, because each each space is different even the temperature uh, of a place and of a city when you do an exhibition has an influence on for example the works on paper which you can show on only for a certain limit of time um, but maybe much more interesting than dubai is at some point where we connect with a lebanese art center which is the beirut art center and in lebanon they have no money i mean but it was that, that collaboration with lebanon was before the the pandemic anyway a few months before but that's much more interesting because we only traveled everything that was printed only this wall we didn't travel the whole exhibition to to beirut to lebanon only this wall that you see including the you know the graphic arts and the and the printed and published material with posters and books etc as the only fragment of the exhibition traveling to lebanon within a different context which was a collective show about independent publishers uh, but this is important for us to be able to do exhibitions that maybe co cost nothing or almost nothing because everything is printed. That's also one of the benefits or pleasures of uh, working with archives. And there are curators from the younger generation who do like printed exhibition like this. Um, Okay, so uh, from there, we obviously uh, expanded our network, you know, thanks to this project about the Casablanca Art School. Uh, we, we upgraded, I was able to hire uh, two persons working with me and really structuring as a, as a small team maybe comparing to an architect studio or a graphic design studio, just that we conceive books and exhibitions. Uh, but it's really, it was a very important step so that we, we are like in depth to the Casablanca Art School because that project put us on the map, so to speak, and then people could get in touch with us and imagine to work with us and just feel confident to invite us, produce a show for them. Or publish a book or both so this was baghdad mon amour at institut des cultures d'islam in paris which is institute of islamic cultures um, which is a rare appellation for a cultural institution somehow paradoxically so it's quite valuable i mean that uh, an institution uh, centered on islamic cultures can propose uh, contemporary art exhibitions and this was an exhibition called so it was in paris and it never traveled and it was an exhibition called baghdad mon amour about contemporary and a few modern but certainly contemporary iraqi artists who digested and 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 backlashed to the the lootings of the iraqi antiquities and the, the lootings of the baghdad museum uh, which is also a very you know, which happened in the beginning of 2000 with the second Gulf War of the American invasion uh, in Baghdad. Um, so different artists uh, who create uh, a makeshift memory or a, a correspondent memory to different events or different iconographies again or collection of images that come from Baghdad and were affected by the 2003 lootings uh, where the Baghdad Museum uh, lost uh, over uh, 1,500 objects um, that were, uh, uh, you know, um, 
circulated in the black market or you know were uh, uh, went through art dealers uh, who were uh, you know wanting to sell them or to or to just uh, keep this these looted objects for themselves or uh, but from 2003 until uh, 2018, for more than 15 years, there has been a police and legal and international case about um, recovering the looted antiquities of the Second Gulf War. So, so all the objects uh, recreated in the exhibition by drawing or by photography, or by maquette, uh, were objects generally looted, so lost or destroyed, or recovered and recollected by the archaeologists and the the internet, the Euro customs uh, police. Little by little, which you can imagine that the Baghdad Museum was uh, closed at that point uh, from 2003, and that it reopened only in 2018, when almost half of the 1,500 objects looted were recovered. Uh, and the museum reopened and functions for the Iraqi people, for the everyday people. But doing an exhibition like we did, uh, you know, the Baghdad Mon Amour, uh, is also a correspondence or a dialogue that we open with the museum and even the officials of the Baghdad Museum. Um, it's like opening up a window between two museums, the museum where you, you create a certain installation with certain artists and the museum that they refer to in their works or, you know, that we, that we elaborate on conceptually, historically, etc., etc. So these are more or less our curatorial projects and exhibition. There has been a little more that you can continue to, to check on the website. And maybe it's worth mentioning the last one because we really like, we really developed the best we could optimizing, you know, our energy, our finances, you know, with fundraising, etc., and how you maintain yourself as an independent platform in order to, you know, to be still relevant for the institutions that will want to work with you so at that so that's the 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 highest scale we achieved which is our last exhibition in in monaco which is in the south of france even if monaco is considered an independent state the second smallest independent state after the vatican uh, but it's also very much related to France and Italy and a lot of other Mediterranean communities since the 19th century. And it's a dialogue between Monaco and Alexandria. So the exhibition is 70% uh, of uh, Egyptian surrealism, but it's Egyptian surrealism seen from the lens of Alexandria, which was the highest cosmopolitan city of the mid-19th mid 20th century which means over a hundred different nationalities and communities who lived in alexandria and not only lived in alexandria but coexisted in the whole ecosystem of alexandria which means that there are certain uh, cultural capitals and mediterranean crossroads including alexandria uh, in egypt where the communities the foreign communities structuring the social and political life together would almost make the city uh, a, a, a zona franca, uh, a, a free zone, um, because the artistic and cultural interaction that happen between Greek community, Italian, German, French, British, Lebanese, Armenian within the same city makes the city a kind of world capital 
recreating the world at the scale of a city, again, which happened in, in places like Alexandria or even places, uh, obviously, uh, like Rome in Italy and London to a certain extent. Uh, to become a world capital. So that's the kind of uh, global connection between Egyptian surrealist and also Italian and French and also even Hungarian or Greek artists, uh, even if the majority of them circulated through Egypt and through Alexandria. And that's what we show in this uh, exhibition. It's the... Um, Definitely the most, uh, the biggest and the most uh, researched and, and ambitious scale uh, project we executed so far. Uh, that even makes me want to go back to smaller projects, even if it's great to do big things, but it's also, of course, exhausting, but also uh not always super flexible and there are also a lot of constraints when you do something at a very big scale and in, implying a lot of uh a lot of uh i mean infrastructure basically and and means of course financial means for the institution who invest in this in this project i'm talking about the production cost the travel cost insurance cost conservation cost i mean and the list is very long uh, so I'm I'm speaking about that because I don't want curatorial activity or uh, curating in general to be limited to limiting projects to projects that are quite rare, you know, to be to be able to to work because of the the, the scale of the museums and the infrastructures that that needs to 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 take part and and it's and it's heavy it's loaded so curatorial activity or the the only idea of making exhibitions or making things public should also of course have its much more flexible much more underground much more alternative context and framework so and i don't want to lose that even if our platform has now developed in a more institutional way but that's also important uh, as a as a matter anyway to of concern in terms of developing your your vision let's say and then of course uh, you have the book section of our website here um not all the books are going with an exhibition or an exhibition catalog per se. We also published some books that go without an exhibition uh, coming from uh, an artist estate, the family of an artist or the artist himself because we also published an artist book. And for example, the Nidal Shamek project who is a contemporary tunisian artist who wanted to publish something like a portfolio so not a book actually but a box a designed box quite minimalistic in which there is a pile of his drawings and also a small notebook with two short essays about his drawing but you experience the drawing as if uh, basically you had uh, very good quality copies of his original drawings and you have 35 of them so it's another way of producing another kind of production it actually takes a lot of time to reach a very good quality outcome um, with that kind of object you, you know if you want it to be long resisting uh, with the long lifetime etc uh, etc et um but which maintains our uh, you know our activity with living em emerging artists of uh, you know artists in their in their 30s let's say and and also as you understood much elder because we our main activity is actually more historical and uh, around the 20th century so uh, the I guess also the model itself, uh, you, you know, needs to develop a certain 
communic both economic and communication strategy. Uh, economic, um, not for the cost of producing an exhibition in itself, because you, as you understood, it's more related to the institution that that produces and finances the exhibition. But, but in my position, I I need to maintain the activity, as I said, of two persons who work with me. Uh, and who um, do different things from research to applying to funds, applications, or develop our network by participating in book fairs or uh, different, you know, platforms and presentations of publishers. Um, and a bit as I'm doing also now, Maybe because uh, when I was asked to speak about students, <laughs> I thought I thought it's interesting, and I thought uh, if I can spread out, uh, you know, different uh, impressions or ideas or uh, even clear objects about uh, curatorial activity and publishing, then it's certainly interesting to see. To see it maybe develop in 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 one of people's mind, or to see what it and what it generates in general, to to speak about it to students, uh, or maybe not students or young adults, or at least people who are thinking about uh, how to how to to create their platform or their activity. So again, it's a lot of I guess contradictions. Uh, and also maybe uh, questions about uh, the reason for doing certain projects uh, rather than others uh, are continuing to inscribe ourselves in a geographical, uh, cultural, uh, I mean, oriented towards what I call the Arab, African, and Asian modernities. Um, and so many ways of uh, looking at it and, and developing it. Uh, there's a lot that we also did with social media, I would say, especially since the beginning of the pandemic. We use the social media a lot. We have someone for that who, who is very young and very curious initially about our activity, but happens to be the best person even if she's uh, 20 years old, 20 years younger than me uh, but she does our social media she um, prepares the posts and the stories on Instagram and she she also deals with our uh, mailing uh, sending the books to different institutions most of the time we convince the institutions to do a project by sending them our books um and so she does a lot for us actually and social media is a very important part i guess nowadays uh among the the different concerns that you can have about how you how you conceive your uh, your product let's say even if it's a pain to to use the word product when you when you speak about culture of course and uh, and i even come from a marxist background so i'm really a leftist uh, I'm not supposed to speak like a, like a producer, let's say. But um, but we also live in a world, uh, if we want it or not, uh, where culture is somehow commodified. Uh, so it doesn't mean necessarily that uh, everything uh, goes back to capitalism. There's always uh, ways to find another way or say something else. But we can't really escape the fact that there is a commodification of culture uh, somehow within cultural institutions and cultural management, let's say. I mean, the word management itself is the, the proof. Um, so, okay, I think it's 40 minutes and I don't want to make it too long. Um, so, of course, if you have any comment or question, or anything um, i'm very happy to discuss you know very informally about what you think about all that so brilliant guys so th thanks moran um we uh, i mean i guess from a practical perspective um the fine art students in fact all the students will be doing showcases um you know in the summer 
and uh, you know the the question around curatorial questions and and uh, maybe the logistics of putting on exhibitions is something um, uh, someone has questions about. But so yeah, I'd like to maybe um, put it out to the audience. Has anyone got any questions? On Or if someone wants to work with us, he, he or she is also welcome, of course. Hello? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I asked you a question and, and the mic was off. Yeah, um, I didn't hear. <laughs> um, so basically, I was trying to say um, it's really interesting to know about how you would approach artists, you know, at the beginning of a project before you've even perhaps even fully know what you want your project to be about. How do you start approaching artists and how do you even know which artists are right for you? Wow, that's, uh, that's an incredible question. But uh, to approach the artist is, I would say, 50% uh, of the work, even if the work is infinite, because as you understood, we try to cover uh, a, a large field, which, as you are pointing out, goes from finding, let's say, marginal artists or marginalized artists in history and then to go through the whole process of not only recovering some of their work if they are lost here and there, but at least to identify the works and then to be able to produce something like a book and an exhibition and then even be able to kind of uh, optimize this book or exhibition by a, by a certain communication strategy, let's say. But the good part of it is that as strategic and economic as I'm speaking now when I say all this and it sounds all super, uh, let's say, uh, you know, strategic, the choice of the artist is purely emotional. It's purely emotional. It's purely people that I loved to meet and gave me something to believe in that I will put my energy for this artist. So it's interesting that uh, from that point on, everything becomes strategy or, you know, planning and conceptualizing. But before that, your question about how do you choose the artist, you know, there's no real answer because you choose the artist or he chooses you. But in a way or another, it's purely subjective idea of which artist should be defended and should be you know worth spending energy and time and investment etc so so there are all artists that i that i feel so compelled and i feel so committed to like i could i could do anything for them honestly to so yeah, yeah. okay thank you Um, if there are no other questions, oh, okay. Hi, Morad. We haven't seen each other for quite a while, so I know we need to touch base at some point. It's Pauline here. Hi. Um, you know, we've met quite a few times through Zeneb, an artist who's being represented um, across the well, globally, but has problems sometimes being represented in London. And even though she's been living in London, is now thinking of moving back to Paris. She's been rep she's going to be representing um, France in the Venice Finale in April this year. And you were talking about dissemination of your exhibitions, relation to publications and the physical exhibition. So my question to you is, which you didn't really touch on, is how do you get people to understand 
what you're doing through this relation, relation to language, you know, translation of language, and also the various countries that you mentioned, there are different kind of Arabic dialects as well. So how does simulation work with the exhibitions and with the print publications as well? So could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, it's it's difficult to to explore that issue. I mean, it's a complex issue. We're not committed to circulate knowledge in Arabic or necessarily in Arabic because, uh, but we are committed to translate a lot from Arabic to English, for example, because even if we are concretely based in Paris, my trajectory uh, made us able to work internationally and, and we're working mainly in English. But then the Arabic is, as in a certain way, always present because it's present in a certain archives that we deal with. And obviously, a lot of the material we work on comes from the Arabic. But the truth is that African Arab modernities have been written in French because of colonial context and reasons. But it happened that a great majority of theoretical production and avant-garde movements in Morocco, in Egypt, in Lebanon, wrote in French. So, you know, it's a sign of colonialism and also a pity that they didn't wrote always in their own language. But we have to admit this uh, multilingual situation and our books and exhibitions are mostly done in English and very often also exist in French and sometimes in Arabic. I mean, I have an example here with me. This is our first pocket book, which is a very small book about Afro-Berber visual culture, which is the pre-Islamic Moroccan and broader African popular arts collected by a gentleman called Bert Flint. And this small book we published in French, English, and Arabic. We could do it. So when, when there is a possibility, when the framework allows it, also because it's a pocketbook and it somehow reduced the investment in comparison to a, a bigger book, because usually we do very big books, uh, we, we would do the Arabic if it's not only socially relevant, but also economically relevant. Because unfortunately, Arabic books, even if after the efforts of circulating them and finding the distribution network or the bookshops within Arab capitals that will make sure your book is sold to Arab uh, people and societies, uh, you still have problems because not it's not like super uh, put commercial potential in the way that it's difficult to sell, even in Arab countries. They, like People don't always put a certain amount of money for an art book or for art historical material, you know. So uh, it's difficult economically to stand for the Arabic but in a way, we stand for the transmission and the translation of Arabic into, let's say, the global scene. So that's more our function, and and that's the the that's the the problems we deal with. But but it's it's difficult to have everything in Arabic. That's very difficult. So you talked about the um, cultural institutions in different parts of the Middle East as well. You mentioned Lebanon being very difficult, a country that had no money when you were doing the exhibition. And you know, I'm just sort of making the connection between um, production, finance, stroke funding to actually do exhibitions and then also to do the publications that you've been doing. And I, you know, I know that you were also been involved in collecting for the tape when you were here in London for five years as well. So I'm just kind of curious in that um, connection between working for the Tate, where the Tate has loads of money up to a point pre-COVID. Obviously, it's going through a crisis at the moment. It's been really pared down. Um, 
and also working with a country like Netherlands, which has no money, and how you generate income for, for someone like a country like Netherlands to actually produce the kind of exhibitions that you want to do. And I know, I'm talking to think about graphic design, quite recently there have been quite a few publications about um, the history of graphic design in the Arabic world and also in China. And I'm kind of curious about that relationship with Tate, which still has this connection, this, this body of actually trying to update its collection and looking at artists from the Middle East. It relates to the question what um, Yasmin was saying is, how do you find the artists to do the exhibitions? And how do Western institutions also find the artists to update their collections, their contemporary collections and their historical collections? And what is that connection with you? You know, do they come to you and say, we don't know, can you help us? And therefore does that help with funding exhibitions that you want to do as an independent platform or do you no longer connect with Western institutions do things your own way so very much, lots of things thrown at you and this is the question and probably this is something when we get together when we have our own private conversation but it's just something to throw at you anyway thank you Pauline yeah I mean the different context with the economic crisis is a, is a crucial point that we are more uh, that we are more uh, let's say um, submitted to i mean that we cope with you know that we we need to overcome somehow but uh, of course places like beirut like uh, baghdad like damascus and like and i'm not even talking about libya for example but these are places where it's almost impossible to do something uh economically connected or uh, with a certain infrastructure you can do things but you can do super grassroots and super uh, local interventions which some curators do and 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 they would need the floor i guess for the curators who are much more dedicated than i in very grassroots and very community driven public interventions or kind of display even though i think the democratization of the museum or democratization of museum practices is never enough there is still a very hard uh, border between museum practice in general and what it could or should generate in more grassroots and more and, and cheaper forms in in very local context and totally beyond museum. Uh, and then, yeah, about what you said at the end about the institutions, I mean, uh, it's a lot of networking and it's a lot of uh, awareness of what's going on elsewhere. You have to maintain your contact, but also that awareness of different museum programs in different parts of the world and try to propose to propose your service to propose your ideas to propose your your concepts so mainly artists that i try to to put in a better light and to to give them a, fra a historical frame an exhibition frame and and to make a difference, you know, may show things that people are not necessarily expecting or things that they didn't see when they at, at their last biennial, etc. Uh, but that also always drew a line between institutions and myself because institutions, uh, it's difficult for them to really take a risk when the artist is very marginal. Uh, which is not, of course, uh, Zineb's case, uh, but uh, but the the global artist nowadays is a different problematic. I mean, the the, the artist that I've been supporting or I've been trying to set up a framework were all in complex uh, contexts with the different between two or three countries in their lives. You know, uh, let's say. Uh, diverted uh, trajectories or uh, uh, ruptured uh, trajectories to say the least you know between different wars displacement exile so, so that kind of story mainly sorry i'm 
difficult to cover all your uh, comments, but uh, it, you you sum it up really well, and you you really help to to grasp everything I wanted to to cover actually. So, final question. Um. So uh, yeah, uh, hold on. Hi. Um. Yeah. So another question. I mean, a lot of the information you've given today has been quite in invaluable. Um. And as a Western Arab, um. I've been going through a phase of relearning um, from outside of a Western perspective and art curators like Fran Lloyd and her study of contemporary Arab women mm -hmm. has, has kind of been like gold to me um, and that kind of relearning. And you've mentioned the mosaic rooms, which I think is something really important to look into. And I was wondering if, if there are any other kind of um, curators or or groups or um uh collectives that you would really recommend someone who is trying to kind of reconnect with middle eastern heritage um the other colleagues are curators and platforms in general i should mention one of them is the arab image foundation in beirut Lebanon. They exist uh, for more than 10 years now, but uh, and even through the explosion uh, of uh, two years ago, they uh, survived and kept uh, their archive alive. So it's uh, you can even explore a lot on the website <clears throat> Arab Image Foundation Beirut. A lot has been digitized. It's a uh, documentary and historical photography heritage institution you know from all the the arab world and they're super important in general i mean because the photographic treasures they have is constitutes a whole background to everything you can think of in uh, in modernization history and uh, and modern modernism in in the arab world um and um, there is an important place um, also in, um, I mean, there are, so, there are quite many, but not all of them developed at the same pace or developed, uh, <clears throat> you know, is, and some of them also don't exist anymore uh, for the crisis reasons and, uh, and the pandemic and so forth. Um, the, in Beirut, also the Sursok Museum. We are in the Lebanese context again, but the Sursok Museum has been doing a very good program and uh, and research around uh, these modernities. You also have uh, Christine Khouri and Rasha Salti, who you know as a duo of curators. Again, Christine Khouri and Rasha Salti worked on the Palestinian solidarity movements and by a whole printed exhibition. The whole exhibition was only reprinted material, not a single artwork, but talking about artistic solidarities, etc. So very strong statement of an exhibition about artistic solidarity without artworks, but with really upgraded archival material. I have the book here. The book is called Past Disquiet, Artist International Solidarity and Museums in Exile. Uh, Museum of Warsaw in Poland and also Chicago University. Um, but if you want, I can make a list because it's diff I can't remember everyone right now, but I'm happy to make a list appreciate it um there's a few students that are just um really obviously interested in this whole area and um it seems to yeah chime and um, maybe um everyone could um yeah just give a hand to um the talk thanks so Thank you. thanks more thanks more that's been a really insightful and um yeah super interesting so um, thanks, everyone, um, and thank you, Morad. Um, we'll see you all again next week. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. So thanks. Bye-bye.